Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this um, afternoon or today, whenever it reaches you in your neck of the woods, we shall be discussing the whole matter of what happened in Venezuela, the whole matter of the people are claiming that it was a vote of fraud and that Maduro, Nicolas Maduro, did not win the election. Now, we're living in some very dark times, and I think that we're living in a post-democratic society. And it's not only in Venezuela, it's in the United States, in all the countries of the Western world. And something that needs to preoccupy our minds, and we need to just look beyond personalities and who is in power and who they're trying to put into power, right? We have to look at the system as it were and to see how the system is crumbling right before our eyes. And many of us are not recognizing it because we have been so divided between the right and the left. And every time I speak to people and you present an argument, they're trying to defend the other side or to defend their side. And the fact of the matter is that you are not on any side, right? Because the fact of the matter, the whole system is controlled by the oligarchs of the world and of that particular country in which elections are being held. The United States, for example, dons itself, right, purports to be the exemplar of democracy in the world. But is the United States, as it likes to proclaim itself, as it has self-described, as it has been self-described, a democracy? Now, the United States, as we understand, based on the Constitution, was not made to be a democracy because democracy always leads into tyranny, right? Always. There is absolutely no um, section of history. We can't, when we read the pages of history, and the Greeks knew that, in which democracy did not end up in tyranny, right? In dictatorship, because it's the rule of the mob, the rule of the majority, right? But when we talk about republics we're talking about the fact that america was created for giving it's a rule of law right because that's what republics a republic state is the rule of law so it gives rights to the majority and it respects the rights of the minority as well so that while the votes might go to the majority but the majority have to respect the rights okay and the privileges of the minority class and that is what the United States meant when it said that he wanted to become a republic, when it became a republic. Now, we are moving into a situation in which our leaders are just preaching this word to us that we are democracy, that we are living in a democracy, and that we should be happy to live in this democracy, and that there is nothing better than a democracy when that is not true. Now, we've got to do our own research, we've got to do our own reflection, and we've got to really unpack the system for ourselves. What I'm seeing, though, is that we are behaving like a pack of dogs in which we want to congregate with the people who are like-minded, right? who, who have attached themselves to a particular political ideology. So whether you're left-wing or you're right-wing. But these two political ideologies are worthless and they will not save our societies from the tyranny that is in that, that's ahead of us because right now I don't think that there is any other way of thinking any other way of explaining what is happening in the world right now than is that we are living in a post democratic society but let's look at some of the dailies all right some of the journals what they're saying today now, we understand here that um, Maduro, there was an election on Sunday, and we understand that Maduro won the election. CNN is saying both Venezuela strongman Nicolas Maduro and opposition claims election win as U.S. voices serious concerns. All right, so we hear that this is the CNN saying both Venezuela strongman Nicolas Maduro and opposition claim right election win. So you're understanding that both parties are saying that they won the election. Right. And that was what happened in the United States in 2020 when Joe Biden came into power. If you remember very clearly, you know, Biden was saying that he won and Trump was saying that he won. And hence we had 
January 6th because both parties were saying that they had won the election and there was no way for citizens to, to say they have or they did not because we obviously don't have the evidence right before our eyes. So we have to just follow what they say, right? So this is something that is chaotic. So we have here both Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro and his political opponent claimed victory in the country's election on Monday. Not was held on Sunday, but it was on Monday, a vote that was marked by accusations of fraud and counting irregularities. It was held on, the elections were held on Sunday, but the results perhaps were tabled on Monday, the final results that is. With 80% of votes counted, Maduro secured more than 51% of the vote, beating the Democratic Unitary Platform, um, that's the PUD, candidate Edmundo Gonzalez Urutia, with his more than 44% of the vote, according to a statement by the National Electoral Council, that's the CNE. So we have here both parties are claiming um, their victory in the recently held elections. Now, both parties we know cannot win, right? There has to be a winner if we're going to have a democratic process, right? But that is not so. We're seeing a lot of confusion in the democratic world in recent times. And we've got to really call these things out and stop just beginning to think that these things are, you know, normal, right? They are normalizing it, as it were, the, the powers that be that telling us that, you know, that democracy is at stake and we have to believe what they tell us. Now, the United States and multiple global leaders voiced skepticism about official results handing presidential um, election victory to the strongman leader. Now, the United States is in a big problem as we speak. I mean, for the life of me, I do not know why the United States would like to meddle in the election of Venezuela, what was happening in the general elections of Venezuela. Why would they do that when the United States is not even an exemplar of freedom and democracy in the world, right? They are not, as we suggested here in 2020, there was wide scale problem with the United States election in which, you know, maybe a third of the citizens thought the elections were stolen and that the elections were not legitimate. Right. Let us not be fooled here. And we had what we had on January 6th. And that was almost like a mini coup of taking over the government. And people think that that was something ordinary. People think that's in light of what is happening now. Right. Joe Biden from the Democratic Party did not want to, you know, resign. He didn't want to leave office. He didn't want to retire from the, the, the job. And we're hearing from Seymour Hirsch, and I'm going to share it with you right now, that there was a coup in the Democratic Party in which President Biden was asked to leave, right? And the Democratic Party is not unified as we think it is. There are lots of financial interests and factions within that one party. And yesterday I was reading an article from the, I think it might have been the New York Magazine, in which it was talking about the fact that from 2014, the DNC, that's the Democratic National um, Committee or Convention, whatever they call it, the DNC that represents the Democratic Party, that they actually were, um, they were actually, what's the word now? They had run out of money. They had become bankrupt. That's the word I was looking for, right? That they were bankrupt in 2014. And guess who bailed them out of that bankrupt bankruptcy? Hillary Clinton. And that is why she wielded so much power over the elections in 2016. And when it should have been given to Bernie Sanders in 2016, it went to her. And the same thing happened when it should have been given to Bernie Sanders in 2020. Again, it was given to her. So she wields a lot of influence and there's an Obama faction too. And the two are at loggerheads. And we're getting the impression that Kamala or Kamala, as she desires to be called because she says her name is pronounced as Kamala. Really a comma as in you have to say it's Kamala. All right, so we have Kamala. Because she said it's very dear to her. In fact, she that's what she writes in her autobiography which are her memoir that I'm actually reading at, at the moment. But the fact of the matter is that she, that's Kamala, sides with Hillary Clinton, right? That's the side that she has taken. And Hillary Clinton is really pushing her candidacy 
to the fore and pressing, pushing hard. And there is an Obama faction. And that is why there are some rumors. We don't know if these rumors are true. Well, we knew, we have the evidence that Obama did not initially endorse Kamala when she actually won the election. Not won the election, but when Joe Biden re re um, resigned and actually endorsed her to be the presumptive de Democratic nominee, right? She did not win the election. She has not won any election. <laughs> so let me just be clear on that. It's just that she actually was selected Right, she was endorsed by the president um, Biden to be the presumptive Democratic nominee, right, for the upcoming general elections, which will be held in the United States this year in November. Now, what happened is that, you know, so we have two factions: we have the Obama faction and we have the Hillary Clinton faction. And normally, the question is, who will win? Right. So let us look at the convention. But I just say this to say that the United States is perhaps one of the most um, corrupt countries right now, if not the most corrupt countries in the world with regard to elections, the process of, of democracy, the, the, the process that democracy should go through is, is not really um, being respected. So we know that the United States does not have the moral authority to really tell any other country what they should or should not do. I'm not suggesting that I think Nicolas Maduro has won. Of course, I don't know if he has won or he has lost. I could not have, and neither do you, right? We only have to listen to what the press tells us and what they're saying to us. And oftentimes, as I've told you, and many times we cannot believe anything that is coming from mainstream media, nothing whatsoever. Right. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We cannot believe anything that the mainstream media tells us because they are, of course, a part of the establishment. Right. We can't even believe what whose side Nicolas Maduro is on, because oftentimes they work together. And at the end of the day, we are the ones who are going to be the losers and not them because they have their agenda and we are not a part of that agenda. Right. In fact, we perhaps we are a part of it in the sense that they want to dominate us, the the commoners, as it were. And we've got to wake up and to understand what is happening in the world. So here we're seeing CNN is telling us that the both parties are claiming that they won the elections, but we know that both of them cannot win the elections. But let me look at a little article here by Seymour Hirsch. Right. And this Seymour Hirsch, let me show you. Uh, Seymour Hirsch actually um, is an American journalist, American investigative journalist. And it says here on Wikipedia that he was born on April 8th, 1937, and he's an American investigative journalist and political writer. He gained recognition in 1969 for exposing the My Lai massacre, massacre and its cover up during the Vietnam War, for which he received the 1970. Um, Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting. During the 1970s, rather, Hirsch covered the Watergate scandals for the New York Times and also reporting on the secret U.S. bombing of Cambodia and the Central Intelligence Agency's program of domestic spying. Now, Seymour Hirsch is a very important investigative journalist in America, very well-respected journalist he is. Now, he's suggesting here, in an article he wrote, uh, which was titled, let me see if I can um, make it a bigger on my screen and then I share my screen with you so that you can see it because, you know, his the, the title of his article and while I'm suggesting, while I'm pulling up this article, please to like the video, right? Put a like and subscribe. Those of you who have not yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel right now. So let me give you a minute to put a like on the video and to subscribe. Thank you so much for having, that was a quick one minute, right? But thank you so much for liking the video and for subscribing. Now, we're going to look now at the article here. Let me share my screen with you that Seymour Hirsch wrote about what happened to Joe Biden's, um, with his, you know, sudden 
retirement or his sudden decision. Well, he hasn't retired yet, but his sudden decision to um, not seek re-election. So we have here leaving Las Vegas inside the last tortured days of the Biden campaign. And that's written by Seymour Hirsch, right? And he went on to talk about what happened in 1967. Shall we? Now, listen to what Seymour Hirsch said. It's not surprising that the long overdue unraveling of President Joe Biden's re-election campaign happened when it became impossible to keep his increasing impairment cover up. Right. So we know that the media were trying to hide the fact that Joe Biden was actually experiencing or is experiencing rapid cognitive decline. They all were telling us that with those of us who were calling that out, that we were lying and that we were just mere detractors and that we were bedwetters and all of the epithets that they hurled at us because they thought we're not living the reality. And one of the things that you have to be careful about right now, the media want to really decide for you what is real versus what is unreal, right? That is what they want to do. As far as they're concerned, they will inform you of the reality. And we saw that during the pandemic. They were telling us what to believe and what they believed in is what we should believe because they have, you know, much more cognitive acuity and mental dexterity to tell us what we should believe and what we should not believe. And many people fall into that trap and they are still falling in the, into that trap, the same trap that we're seeing right now. It was the big time money backers of the Democratic Party who called off the game of see no evil, hear no evil after Biden's shocking performance in his June debate with Donald Trump. They backed at continuing to give millions of dollars to the party now that there was evidence that the president is not always there. So we have the, the big donors are the ones who make the decision, not the people not the electors that people are thinking that, oh, you, we're living in democracy, so we, the citizens, are the ones who vote for our leaders. No, we don't. And that is what we have to understand. And so what is happening in Venezuela now is just what happens in all parts of the Western world, right? But it is who the elites want, right? And, or a certain type of elites, because remember now that you have different factions that the elite class serves, we have to understand that. Remember now that during slavery, and it's very important that we make this point, and I think I've made this point over and over again, but let me try to cement it into your brains. During the Civil War of the United States that was waged in 1861 to 1865, it was waged, of course, well, the end game was, you know, slavery was the um, thing, but it was they, they don't have in the mind that they wanted to free the slaves. Both the North and the South were pro-slavery, right? Both the North and the South were pro-slavery, right? So we need to get out of this mindset that the North was anti-slavery and they were fighting for the, the, the abolition of slavery. They were not. Maybe a few men were, but for the most part, the system demanded that slavery was kept intact, right? Because that's how it, it, it survives, right? That's how it became wealthy. And who wants to give up their wealth? Nobody wants to do so, including many Black people now who are talking against slavery. If they were a part of the system, just like they have jobs now, and sometimes you support genocide and other things because your boss does that, that is what your organization supports, the same thing happened during slavery. The men who were being enriched did not want to, did not want to terminate that system, right? Because it was a corporate system. It was a corporation, something that we must understand. However, there are there were factions between the North and the South. The Southerners, because slavery was actually directly done, they practiced there, right? And they were the ones who, with the most wealth. Well, I shouldn't say with the most wealth, but they had really gotten a lot of money from it. The North, of course, they built industries from the proceeds of, of slavery. So I think, of course, the Southerners had much more say because I think they had more money. Right, and that's why they had more power in Congress. And the Northerners were very upset. The what they the Northern elites they were upset that the Southerners controlled everything and everything that they they crafted policies and whatever they say was what should be done, and they wielded a lot of power over the nation's Congress. So there was definitely a war between these two factions. 
But the fact of the matter is the point I'm trying to raise here is that both sides, both the North and the South were pro-slavery because it was very clear, Abraham Lincoln was very clear that he wasn't anti-slavery. He was against the expansion of slavery and the Southerners wanted to expand slavery across the United States, particularly in the Midwestern, in, you know, where you have California and the newly um, discovered states. They wanted to take slavery there and Abraham Lincoln and other discerning men and women understood that if you expand slavery, then the entire United States is going to become a slave holding nation. The entire country, if it had been permitted, would have become a slave holding nation. And that was not what people like the Lincolns and other people who wanted the United States to prosper, they understood that that would tear apart the foundations of its liberty. And that's what Abraham Lincoln was saying. You know, I am not anti-slavery. I just want to save the union. And he understood that the expansion of slavery would not have saved the union. In fact, the Southerners were so much futuristic and ambitious that they wanted to even spread slavery across the Caribbean, including Cuba. They wanted to take over from the Spanish and perhaps would have taken over some of the British colony if they had gotten the opportunity to have done so. That is how ambitious they were, right? And Abraham Lincoln and the Northerners would not have had it, right? Because they knew that the more these guys would have expanded on slavery, the more power they would have gained in Congress. I'm not sure what, what is coming here. The more power they would have in Congress, so what they did is that they decided that they would go to war, right? And the rest is history. Fast forward today, we have the same elites, right? Can they make no bones about it? We have the same elites. And these elites are trying to divide us. And they also are combating for who is going to reign supreme, which side of the faction is going to reign supreme, just like we have in the Democratic Party, the faction, the, the Obama faction, and the Clinton faction. And which faction? Who is going to reign supreme? That is a question. So it seems to me that when Obama didn't want to, to acknowledge and to endorse Kamala for, or Kamala <laughs> for the election, that, you know, that was the sort of tentative, you know, I want to win. And it seems to me that if if Kamala wins the election, that Hillary, the Hillary faction would have won. Now, the question is, where did Hillary Clinton get all of that money to have bailed out the Democratic Party um, bankruptcy in 2000? The, 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 that's the DNC bankruptcy in 2014. Don't know. I don't have a clue where she got that money from, but obviously from the elites, right? From the reigning elites. So we have here that, you know, um, he says here that Biden's shocking performance in his June debate with Donald Trump, they, well, I read this already, you'd think it would be a vigilant press corps led by the New York Times and the Washington Post who first broached the issue of Biden's impairment. But those papers missed the story. The first significant report came in early June from the Wall Street Journal, whose, consistent, who, whose consistently brilliant news section considered suspect by the, the Times and the Post and many readers because of the paper's conservative editorial page and the fact that it is part of the Rupert Murdoch's new core, news core. Wrote the story on the front page under the headline behind closed doors, Biden shows signs of slipping. Now, this is what happens in, in, in the United States and around the world. People tend because they hear a news story from the other side, whether from the right or from the left, to not believe it because it came from the other side. But what if it is true? If it is true, you ought to embrace it and stop saying because they just say that people, you know, from the Democratic Party, they really view with any left, they view with a lot of skepticism that what happened last Sunday with Biden, you know, um, not seeking re-election is a coup. To them, it's not a coup because guess what? Fox News said it and the right-wing people said it. So it can't be a coup. You have to seek arguments that are weak, even when the evidence is right before your eyes, right? But you decide that you don't want to admit that it was a coup. 
because the president doesn't want to leave office and he's forced to leave office, that is a coup, right? Because in a democratic process, the people should have the say. And if the people say that they didn't want Biden, which they have been saying for a long time, and Biden failed to resign, and the elites were telling us that he was not suffering from cognitive decline, eventually they admitted that he was. And it was when they admitted that he was that they wanted the people to convince the, 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 the populace that he was. So it means, therefore, that America is not a democracy, it's not a true democracy as it preaches because it would have long, you know, he did to the desires of the, of the populace, of the electorate, but that was not their desire. Their desire is to continue with the desire or the desires of the oligarchy. That is what you have to understand. So let's continue. Um, let me, oh, I didn't share my screen. Let me go back to sharing my screen with you. Um, I think that I read something and you did, you were following, right? So let me go back and share my screen with you. So who in Washington didn't know that Biden was failing? We all did, right? We all did up to a point. I had learned months earlier from a federal official that those in the front rows of university events where Biden was speaking were warned not to move if the president tripped while walking to the podium. Secret service agents were in hand to pick him up immediately. There would be no front page photos of a college valedictorian helping the president climb to his feet. Right? So we could see that the president was in decline. Right? Now, listen to what Hirsch is saying. After the debate, there was mounting pressure on Biden to drop out. So, he, and we saw that, that they came and they were saying that he needs to go, and particularly on the Obama side. The White House and the president himself denied that he was suffering from anything more than a bad day, a cold and a jet lag. It seems to me also, the more I read, that Hillary Clinton, because, you know, she's supporting Kamala, she wanted Kamala, or she wanted Biden to remain in office, and she knows that Biden would have, you know, had to have gone. And then Kamala would just, you know, naturally taken over. You know, had let us say, for example, had Biden successfully gotten the re-election and had won the presidency. I'm sure that, you know, um, Hillary, Secretary, Harry, Secretary, Secretary Hillary Clinton, she knew that Biden would not have been able to continue. He would not have been able to, um, to finish his presidency, his term, right? So what she did now, she was waiting faithfully and she kept on saying that Biden was in good standing and his health was okay and his you know, you know, his seniority, his old age had nothing to do with his mental decline. And perhaps it didn't, but he is suffering from mental decline, but she also was one of the people who did not acknowledge it, right? That he was because she had her agenda and she was sticking to her agenda, which is to get Kamala elected. There were newspaper stories about Hunter Biden, the president's convicted son, keeping by his side and warning all White House staffers that anyone who even hinted at the truth would be fired. And this is Joe Biden's son doing that. Now, what if this was one of, um, what's his name, Donald Trump's son? Wouldn't that have been in the media? And uh, the whole obstruction of the whatever, the process of the people having their will, right? But this is what Hunter Biden was doing. That message quickly was leaked to the press and the press said nothing. Soon the White House press corps suddenly discovered that they were being misled by the president's press secretary. There were lots of tortured questions and broken hearts, but the message was the same. The president is in good health and is going to run for re-election this fall and call and carry on serving for four more years after he defeats Trump. Right? Trump. Now, something that he writes here, a series of blog posts Local police reports, internet messages, and reports in the Daily Mail disclose further details of Biden's trip to Las Vegas and his abrupt return to Delaware. I went over these reports this week with a senior official in Washington who helped me fashion an account of a White House in complete disarray, culminating in the president's withdrawal from the race. 
is a story not unlike Seven Days in May, the Cold War thriller in which a colonel played by Kirk Douglas foils a coup staged by a general played by Bert Lancaster. None of what you read below comes from an official account by the White House. At that point, according to Emily Goodin, a Daily, uh, Daily Mail reporter who was in the traveling press pool, the president was deathly pale and Air Force One flew at maximum speed to Delaware where the president has a weekend retreat at Re Reberhof Beach. The press pool was told that Biden had COVID. Nothing more was said on Air Force One. After Biden's return to Delaware, the White House told the public that Biden had contracted a COVID infection and will be in isolation. He was said to have upper respiratory symptoms, a runny nose, a cough, and was fatigued. Right? So this is what they were telling us. And people just believed that he had COVID and he had to be isolated and he would have got, he had been treated and he would have, you know, returned to his work. But that was the last straw for a core group of congressional leaders, government officials, and some senior Biden funders who were withholding huge amounts of committed contributions. So it seems to me that there was a lot of war. Let me turn off this. So sorry about that. So there was a lot of war in within the Democratic Party with regard to Biden. Right. So there was pressure on donors to come across on their pending commitments. Officials told me it was understood that Biden had a physical problem in Las Vegas and the family was saying no to continued pressure from donors and senior Democrats in Congress to withdraw from the presidential campaign. Initially, the president could not be reached. Now, on Saturday, July 20th, former President Barack Obama was deeply involved and there was thought that he would, he would place a call to Biden. It was not clear whether Biden had been examined or just what happened to him in Las Vegas. The big three, the official said, referring to former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senator Majority Leader Charles Schumer, and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, continued to be directly involved. On Sunday, the official said to me, or told me, with the approval of Pelosi and Schumer, Obama called Biden after breakfast and said, here's the deal. We have Kamala's approval to invoke the 25th Amendment. So here is a president, right? Here is a president saying to the sitting president, a former president rather, President Obama, the former president, saying to the sitting president, we have the approval of the vice president, Kamala Harris, to invoke the 25th Amendment, which suggests that you have to go. No, this is a former president telling a sitting president that he has to go and working along with the vice president, the sitting vi vice president Kamala Harris and telling the sitting president that he has to go. Now, whether or not we like Joe Biden, and I'm no fan of Joe Biden, but he is the sitting president. And how is it that a former president is going to work along with the, vice, the sitting vice president against the president with whom she's working? Right? Isn't that to you something that resembles a coup? Or is it something that is ordinary? And you can say, yes, he was stubborn, he was obstinate, but we understand that the people were saying resign. They were already saying before resign. And they were telling us, no, Joe Biden is in the best of health and he's sharper than attack. Right? But when they decide to do it, we should listen and they should carry out their nefarious activities. Because that is not good for precedence that, that is setting for the institution, for the office of the presidency. That you're going to have a former president having such a major thrust and wielding so much power over a sitting president. That is something that is not normal in America's, you know, years of being a republic. I know that it's no longer a republic. But let's say that it was as constitutionally until the constitution is fully, you know, um, denounced, renounced, then I think that it is still a republic. It is still a constitutional republic. 
It is not a democracy. The United States was founded as a constitutional republic. It's fast shedding its its wing. It's it's its fat. It's um what do you call it now? It's feathers, if it or it's um its skin, as it were. Right, of being that constitutional republic, but we've got to still claim that you know until it decides that it no longer wants to be a constitutional republic and it sheds every principle, every principle rather of its constitution. We have to claim it because then we are going to be in full scale tyranny. And many of us don't understand what tyranny is. We think it's just some, you know, the president telling us what to do. We don't understand it's going to be torture and it's going to be what happened and worse during the dark ages. And many of us don't even have a clue what the dark ages were. Right, we don't have a clue. We have taken freedom for granted. Now we think to go to work and come back and to go to the supermarket and to speak to our friends, and we think that yeah, and we should. Right, we should really respect and to try to honor to to, to seize these moments, but the fact is that these moments are not going to last forever. Right, and we are seeing now that we are treading in the direction of a post-democratic society, right? So here we have, let me see if I can share a few more thoughts with you from just, to, I'm just trying to show you that what is happening in Venezuela is not unusual. It's happening in Washington too, right before your eyes. And Americans are, well, some are not seeing it. The amendment, that's the 25th amendment, provides that when the president is determined by the vice president and others to be unfit to carry out the powers and duties of his office, the vice president shall assume those duties. Yes, but it has to be an agreement, right? And the electorate should be informed thusly. It was clear at this point, the official said that she would get the nod. That is, the support to run for presidency in the November election. But Obama also made it clear, the official said, that he was not going to immediately endorse her. But the group had decided that her work as a prosecutor would help her deal with Trump in a debate. Right? So that's what they're going to do. It's strategy. Because, of course, Trump is now what is deemed to be the convicted felon. Right? As the Supreme Court had recently called him. So she's going to use all her legal, you know, skills to actually claim him as such. And because she knows all of those 34, you know, um, counts of felony that he was alleged to have committed, then she's going to use that. She has so the legal skills to do that. And she's going to be engaging him in that debate, which has nothing to do with the nation's business. Right, but it is going to help her in perhaps winning him. Right, she's going to look at all of those 34 accusations and she is going to have a field day with them. She is going to have a field day with them, including the whole question of abortion and reproductive rights, according to what the left would want you to believe. Now, when women have an abortion, it has to do with their reproductive rights <laughs> right that's what it's all about but does it now well, let us look at something that is very very important for us to understand let me sh share my screen here just to read you this so you can see what i'm saying i don't want you to think i am saying some things that i'm it's coming from my head only, right? Why? It might be coming from my head, but it's supported by evidence. And this guy is speaking to people who work in the White House, right? To his sources who actually work in the White House, so they know what they're talking about. Now, a key factor in the decision to force Biden out of office by invoking the 25th Amendment was a series of increasingly negative polls on the president's standing against Trump that had been commissioned by the, found the founders, the official said. The downward slope was increasing, Polling would also be important for the vice president, I was told, and was agreed that if the polls did not continue to show her gaining traction, other options would be considered, including an open convention. I was unable to learn if Harris was aware of such considerations or whether she intends to abide by them. So here we have that it's all based on the polls, right? It's not about the people's will. 
It depends on the polls because, again, these are the donors and the donors want to win. And they're looking at the polls and they're seeing, you know, if we cast our bet on Joe Biden or on Trump, who's going to win? Right. And people like to put their money on the side of the winner. Right. So when they saw now that Biden had had the, a catastrophic performance at the recently um, debates with Trump, then they say, we are not going to give him our money. We are not going to endorse him. Right. We have to endorse Kamala or Kamala. But if Kamala, if she also are having endorsed her, she does not also gain traction in the polls. We're going to give her up. <laughs> Now, you tell me now, ladies and gentlemen, what democracy are you living in when that is happening right before your eyes and people are just electing, selecting and, you know, and unselecting as it were, <laughs> you know, your presidents without your even not having an, any idea of what is happening behind the scenes, right? So the whole matter of Nicolas Maduro and his the opposition in Venezuela claiming victory is nothing new. It's, and it's going to be the, I think it's going to be more of the norm than the exception in elections to come. Because the United States is setting a very dangerous trend, as it were. Right? A very dangerous path on which they are walking. Because we all knew that Biden was suffering from rapid cognitive decline even before he won the election in 2020. But throughout his term, throughout his presidency, we were told that he was competent and that age had nothing to do with it and that he is this wonderful grandpa who loves his grandchildren and he's a great dad. Right? That is what we were told. And he is more competent than Trump is. Because Trump is a fascist, he's a dictator. And they tell us what we need to think about even the personalities. <laughs> even though we should not be concerned about personalities. But they're even trying, they're not only trying to, 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 to convince us about the policies, but they're trying to also tell us what we should consider about the different characters and personalities. Because we're not intelligent enough, after all. Right? They are the ones who are truly endowed with the intellectual capacity to determine who is who, right? Because our brains are not functioning. And they are right to an extent because we have been distracted by the entertainment, this long lived entertainment that we, are, we find ourselves in with our smartphones and Olympics and the NFL and the basketball games and all of these things. We are distracted by these inconsequential things that have nothing to do with anything. And because of that, we see where the oligarchy now is taking full control and they're not even hiding it. Right? And they're enacting coups and, you know, and we and just get prisoners out. Simple. They're not performing, get them out. They're not doing what we want them to do to garner more money, get them out. Right? And we're seeing now the same thing is happening in Venezuela, where we have the incumbent government and the opposition and government saying that they're not, they have won the election and you, you only can have one person to win to, to, to win the election. Only one person can win the election, right? It's not possible for both to win, right? But whenever we're talking about government and winning, it has to do with financial interests, as we see is happening in the United States. The oligarchs on the Democratic in the DNC, they know that they could not have relied on Biden to carry home successfully the Democratic ticket in the general election. And then they would have lost lots of their investment because it's about the country. It's about money. Just like we saw in the pandemic, right? It was about or it is about money financial returns and that is what we've got to understand and we have not yet begun to understand that now the thing about the whole question of what happens here we have Al Jazeera 
is saying that protest break out as Maduro declared winner of this disputed Venezuelan election. And we are hearing lots of, you know, um, severance of diplomatic relations with Venezuela, right? We have the Dominican Republic, among other nations in Latin America and maybe around the world who have severed their diplomatic ties with Venezuela because of the president's um, victory. That's Maduro's victory. Now, should that be happening? I don't think that that should be happening until you have an objective international body who have actually, or which have, um, you know, investigated what took place in Venezuela and then declare who won the elections. But we cannot trust the OAS, we cannot trust the United States, we cannot trust a lot of the governing bodies, we can't even trust the UN to do what they should do. Right? Because the UN sides with the United States and its agenda. And the OAS also. So this now we are in a predicament because our institutions are captured, are captured by financial oligarchs. As a result of that, they do things within to meet that sort of their financial rewards and their financial interest. It has nothing to do with national interest, with developing the country and the interest of the masses of people that live in these countries, including in the very United States. You know, this morning I was thinking as I thought about the British Empire and the American, the now American Empire, and there might be a lot of parallels that we need to explore. But something I thought, you know, the British had their empire and they actually functioned outside whatever happened, at, you know, because well, it's an empire, so it happened outside of the, out of the mainland or outside of the country itself, right? So slavery, you know, happened outside of Britain. And the British in those days would have been so, you know, ignorant of what was happening in these slave colonies they would have been ignorant and would not be able to even conceive the evil deeds that the British Empire were actually doing within, in these colonies, like Jamaica and Barbados and all the islands and you know countries in, in India. They would not have had a clue. In the same way, Americans do not have a clue, most of them, even though we have access to more information now of what the American empire is doing around the world. They are clueless. As a result of that, they do not understand that the same tactics and strategies are being practiced right now there on the mainland in the United States. The same tactics, the same coups that were done are now being done. And worse is yet to happen. It is just the beginning of sorrows because we have not been alert as to what the political process is about and what it entails. There are people who laugh when you talk about the military industrial complex. They laugh, well, what is he talking about? <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything because you, you lack the intelligence to grasp that the military industrial complex is what runs the show, right? And killing human lives and undertaking coups Right, is what the military industrial complex does. And unapologetically, it's really pride and joy to, yeah, to spark a coup, right? To undertake a coup, that gives the MIC its joy and its pride. Now, this is coming from Al Jazeera. Let us look at what Al Jazeera is saying about the protest here. Because people are protesting. The citizens of Venezuela are protesting. Protests break out as Maduro declared winner of disputed Venezuela election. World leaders and other observers call for full breakdown of election results as opposition says vote barred by fraud. And they have been saying fraude, fraude, which is fraud, 
right? The word fraude in Spanish means fraud. They have been saying that and nobody's listening. Venezuelans have taken to the streets after the electoral authority officially declared President Nicolas Maduro the winner of an election that the opposition says was marred by fraud. Protests have erupted across the country with demonstrators even toppling a statue of Maduro's predecessor, Hugo Chavez, in the state of Falcon. Right, so that's where they are. No, they are protesting. They are saying that they, it's going to fall. It's going to fall. This government is going to fall. Some of the protesters shouted, "It's going to fall." So we are moving into anarchy. Right. Not only are we moving into a post-democratic, but you know, the post-democratic um, nation or society is going to be a society that is filled with anarchy on the land in the land. Right. That's where we're moving to. We're moving into that direction, not only in Venezuela, but around the world. As people begin to lose confidence in the political process, which we are seeing happening right before our eyes in the United States. Right. In which the democratic process is not transparent and the oligarchy does not respect the will of the people. Right, because it's no longer democ dem democracy of or by or, or from the people. It's of by or, yeah, it's of from or by the people. Right? Is it is that what we say? <laughs> Whatever. Right? But you know, it's now democracy of and by and, you know, of by and from the people, from uh, you know the the oligarchy. Right. The oligarchy is what is the most important aspect of the or democracy. And they decide, they decide it is their will that counts, right? Their will is what predominates. We don't, we're not free, right? We are not free. We're not living in free societies as you think you are. And you've got to wake up and stop thinking that you are in this free society and you're waiting on Trump or you're waiting on Biden or you're waiting on Nicolas Maduro or you're waiting on Andrew Bonuses and all of these people. You're waiting on Mark Golding to free you because that's not going to happen because they are in bed with the financial elites. And the financial elites see them as their slaves because look at what happened to Biden. A man with decades of experience right, and get a coup with the complicity of his own vice president, whom he chose. And I understand that he didn't want to choose her. He never wanted to choose Kamala. They had to, for a long time, they had to try to convince him to choose her. It, it, it was not his favorite. She was not the person he wanted to run with. But again, the oligarchs won the show. And Joe had to listen to whomever they tell him to run with, and he ran her on the ticket, and you know he won. Right, and the same person that he actually gave it to, who did not deserve it, she did not like she had done anything spectacular in this in the political world, but he gave it to her, and she seemed, based on all indications, to have betrayed him. That was an act of treason. And that happens a lot in politics. So if they can portray their own colleagues, what do you think they would do to you? Right? What do you think they will do to you, the ordinary citizen? Right? Do you think that they are going to embrace you and they're going to be loyal to you? You are living in a lala land, in a world that does not exist. Right, And if you think Trump is going to change America, he's not. Right, Because he, he's controlled by the same elite. Right, They might represent a different faction of the elites, but they are the oligarchs. And even your very politicians are objects to be used and abused and to be spat out if they need to spit them out. Right? So who do you think you are? So whether it's Maduro or another person that comes to the 
presidency in Venezuela, la agenda continua, right? The agenda continues, right? The agenda continues, and that's what it's going to be, right? Because right now we can see a consolidation of powers coming together to inflict their nefarious agenda upon a very unsuspecting world, unsuspecting citizens who don't really care about democracy. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you subscribe. Remember now to like the videos and to subscribe. Just hit the 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 the, 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 the subscribe button, right? There's a button on your on the left hand corner of your phone or your computer. Just hit that. It's it's free, of course. Nothing it really does not cost you anything to subscribe. So just hit that button, subscribe, and to hit the like button so that the videos can be shared with as many people on the platform. Thank you so much for joining. Hasta entonces. Hasta luego. Ciao.